I said, he said, he's coming off course. What I found ironic was the majority of those people felt that 71% of the 54% that favored the vouchers felt that um, there should be increased support for public schools and only 28% thought there should be increased support for private schools. I so they're, they're good with that, but, but the, I'm thinking, I'm looking at that and thinking, okay, you feel that the private vouchers are enough in the public schools or the voucher system. It could be. And how it affects the, the it public could be. I just found it kind of ironic that 50% yeah. were for it, but then the majority said, but don't give them, the, but they should have more money. Yeah, it was yeah. odd. Um, big thing in Madison is, um, and I've talked about this before, that reading legislation that did pass. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to create an office of literacy through the DPI. Um, it creates a literacy coaching program. And it's going to sign 64 contracted literacy coaches to traditional public schools and charter schools and private schools that are participating to provide support to the administrators. Um, it creates a grant to cover 50% of the cost of purchasing approved curriculum. It prohibits the use of instruction or materials that contain the three queuing versus phonetic. Um, and, and it teaches a student to read based on meaning and structure and, the, and visual cues or memory. And it, you can't use visual cues or memory um, or meaning and structure. It increases the in frequency of screening and diagnostic reading assessments. We had to know that was going to happen because they're going to want to test it more, right? And it requires changes in how educators are prepared to te for teaching. Um, the 2023-25 biennial budget includes $50 million um, for this. And um, so we'll see how it turns out. The $50 million, I think, could probably be spent quite quickly. Because, you know, there's, they, never, they, never, um, they never give you enough. Um, and then, big thing in <laughs> medicine is now is Governor Evers has vetoed a lot of the state budget. Um, he primarily raised a uh, rollback tax cuts proposed by um, the legislature and then partial vetoes that leaves the state with a projected $4 billion surplus according to the fiscal bureau. Um, now the big thing is, okay, so now what are they going to do? They've got to agree on this money. Are they going to spend it? What are they going to do with it? Um, but if they don't come to some agreement, it's going to stay there until the next budget comes winding around. Uh, let's see, and then in the budget, um, this is this interesting? When he vetoed and moved this and moved that, it gave us a um, $325 per pupil increase on revenue limits, um, and then it's going to increase the low revenue ceiling from $10,000 to $11,000, which were a low revenue, um, for the biennium. <laughs> but it also, it also ensures that the $325 um, increase for the next 400 years. So mm -hmm. I don't know what, you know, who knows what the budget, <laughs> they, everybody's kind of upset about that, but past governors have all done the same. Um, I know it's gonna go into the Supreme Court. Um, they're gonna fight it, but I, I don't think, because it's past present, other governors have done vetoes and all this, I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna fly. Uh, but what the budget did, what he did was, it provides $97 million to achieve the special education reimbursement of 33.3%, um, which is, will be huge for us. Uh, it invests $406.8 million for the high cost of special education aid. Um, it's current 39.5% to 45% and then to 50% in 24-25, which is, like I said, which is huge for our district because you know what our special education right. budget looks like, so right. that's wonderful. Uh, $3 million for bilingual bicultural aid, uh, $5.9 million to increase the reimbursement rate for high cost transportation. Um, let's see. $30 million um, to continue funding for the school based mental health model. Get kids ahead. And the budget increases the state funding $1.2 million over the biennium to fully fund the state's sparse aid program for eligible districts. 
So there is money in there. Um, I was really happy to see the special ed, mm -hmm. special ed one. And the 325 locked in for however many years before the, it won't it won't go that long. But I mean, it at least guarantees it for a couple of years. We can plan on because we didn't get any, even any cost of living for you know years and years and years. So yes, at least yes. the schools can plan in our budget at least for the next couple of years. We know what we're going to get, and that helps. Yeah, I, I was reading on this, and you know, Governor Walker, I think he. He put a moratorium for a thousand years on some kind of, um, I can't remember what it was, I, I couldn't believe it, um, for energy, for energy. A thousand years? Okay, I'm done. Okay, questions or comments? All right, we'll keep going. Um, we don't have anybody in the CISA right now, hoping to fill that soon. Um, don't have a student? Summer, don't have any misconceptions or rumors. Shelly, did anybody sign in to speak? No. Okay, we're moving right along. Um, um, board have, Sorry, we do have one oh, okay. wrote in um, okay. for public comment that I would like to share. Um, it says, good afternoon. I was unable to attend the school board meeting tonight and wondering if you'd be able to announce some good news on my behalf. The class of 1983 held its reunion on Saturday, July 22nd at the Boat Club. It says, we were challenged by the class of 1982 to fundraise more money than they had the previous year. Within two days, we pulled together items for people to purchase. We even had members of the class of 82 crash the reunion to add to the challenge. <laughs> it was a success and we raised $305. We hope to continue this event and challenge more classes to participate. I will submit the money to the high school later this week. Sincerely, Amy Blahoviak Johnson, class of 1983. <laughs> That's fun. Okay. We okay. thank them for that. Yeah. All right. Now, board president announcements. Um, update on board vacancy. I am proud to announce that we had a outstanding response. We had actually nine people indicate their interest. One of them did not live in the city, so we have eight that we are going to be looking at later tonight. Um, it's you know um, a wonderful challenge we're going to have to try and pick from that group because there's lots of you know lots of different. Um, people with different backgrounds and um, so we'll just have to pick the, the best one for now but um, it gives us hopefully a lot of opportunity to get the people interested and involved in the school district um, and of course future elections which are always coming up so um, so yeah we will be reviewing all those applications um, later in closed and then decide what the next step is I was very pleased. Um, administration reports, starting with you. All right, we'll start off with our facility study. Um, we have some representatives from McKin Street and Bayland here to present. Um, I just wanna give a little brief introduction to the process that we've gone through here, and we'll go into a little more detail, but this process really started about six months ago um, when we, as the board decided that a facility study was needed to really look at some of the needs and wants of the district to make sure that our facility, our buildings, um, our equipment, our <coughs> resources are up to par and giving the best education possible to our students. And so it began with us looking at three different companies. Um, we interviewed them and narrowed them down to one, which was McKinstry. And we've used McKin Street and Bayland um, building for other projects within the district to have been very pleased with them. So we were happy that they partnered with us again for this upcoming project. Um, the purpose of the facility study was really to have an outside organization look at our needs and wants of the district and to give us a perspective of things that maybe just someone who is involved with the facilities every day doesn't get to see. And so their insights, their perspective was really um, helpful. So um, I think you'll find the presentation tonight to be very informative, maybe some surprises along the way, um, and it will help us in making decisions as a district on how we want to move forward. So 
I want to turn it over to Eric Runes from McKinstry, Brent Schmidt from McKinstry, Vice um, from Bayland, and Chris Peoples from Bayland. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for. All right. So as uh, Mr. Brinkman introduced to all of us, I'm Eric Runes. Uh, I've been with McKinstry for a little over a year now. Uh, prior to joining McKinstry, I was. I had a 26-year career in public education with the last 11 of those years as a school district superintendent uh, for the Whitewater Unified School District and the Forest Area School District. Um, so I really enjoyed my transition to McKinstry and being able to support school districts, school boards, administrations as they try to determine facility solutions and you know, uh, meet the needs of your instructional programming and your greater community. Um, so we're gonna go over our facility study, but we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves. Yeah, uh, Brent Schmidt with McKinstry. Um, I am on the project development side, so I work with school districts all over the state to help identify uh, maybe some deficiencies or areas of improvement from both an energy perspective as well as uh, a facilities perspective. So I you know, work with development to put together uh, scopes of work and then help put pricing together and kind of move into a contract um, with the district. So obviously, you know, we're looking at the facility study right now, identifying some areas where uh, we feel like Uh, Jim Tice with Bayland Buildings um, in sales. I um, was in the field doing uh, concrete for steel erection all the way through so five, six years, and then in, been in the sales and estimating area for about the last 15. Um, been at Bayland for 14 years, and I have personally worked with the Algoma School District on both the um, most recent projects here at the high school and at the elementary school. I'm Chris Peoples. Uh, I've been working in architecture for 12 years and I've been a licensed architect in the state of Wisconsin for three. Um, I primarily specialize in commercial, industrial, um, and educational <coughs> projects and basically I work on designing uh, projects to suit the needs of the owners um, at Bayland. So again, thank you for this opportunity to partner with the school district and the board and the administration and hopefully I help in, inform your future decision making around facility solutions. So as uh, Mr. Brinkman shared, uh, McKinstry in partnership with Balin was hired to um, provide an independent objective analysis of your buildings and facilities. Uh, we did that um, and identified a number of opportunities and potential solutions and had in that facility study report that all of you should have received in your packet, um, cost estimate ranges. So you can begin to start thinking about how you might want to package certain solutions. Um, when we did that, we really were looking at a number of things. We wanted to make sure that we were meeting the, the needs of your uh, instructional programming, that uh, were there opportunities to make the district more efficient, um, where there are some edges for growth because you had some uh, equipment that you were nearing the end of its life cycle, um, suggesting needed maintenance, and then also just always trying to be energy conscious. So we, we believe that the study that we provided um, was focused on that and reflects that. Uh, as Jesse said, this, is a, this has been a six month process. Um, our process started uh, with a kickoff meeting back in February. Um, we did the walkthrough in March uh, we met with a planning committee, uh, which uh, Mr. Brinkman uh, brought together about a dozen internal staff and uh, two board representatives uh, to review and also interview and determine if we're on if the facility study items were on the right path and were there anything missing. We then again met in May to review the the additional findings or suggestions and started putting together some. Uh, cost ranges, and then um, that final facility study report was shared uh, with uh, Ms. Brinkman, and then again this evening we're presenting. I mentioned that planning committee. Uh, these were the members of that planning committee, just to give you a sense that, um, you know, it's a, it's a nice cross-representation of staff, 
board members, administration, um, and it was intended to be able to uh, get their perspective on the conditions of the facility, the programming needs of the school district, your community usage of the facility, um, and trying to pull all that together to make sure that whatever was identified and ultimately made the, the report um, made sense and met not only the school district's uh, needs, but also the greater community's intent for their facilities. Uh, one of the things that we did ask the planning community to do was to kind of think about guiding principles. Now, these aren't certainly formal guiding principles because that is uh, some a responsibility of the school board, but we did spend some time talking about what are some principles that if they're looking at facility issues and needs and solutions, what type of lens should they be looking through? So this is just a list, um, and as the board, or if the board decides to move forward with, um, towards these solutions, uh, you know, you have a good starting point for maybe identifying some guiding principles if you are going to engage your greater community in some discussions or maybe create a, a task force to review this report from the community's perspective, that gives them a lens to look at it as well. But as you look at that list, um, I would hope that most of it aligns with uh, the board. Um, there was, you know, obviously safety and security was a priority. Uh, everybody always, always wants to be very tax conscious, making sure that that financial impact is not, that's something reasonable and something the community can support. Access for all students. Um, I can tell you that one of the things that was remarkable to us was clearly your community in great partnership with the district utilizes your facility, so that was also a priority to make sure that the community continues to have great access. Uh, considering what's happening in the district, whether it's uh, increasing or declining enrollment, what's happening in the greater community, um, that decisions are focused on making sure that connectedness, collaboration, whether during the school day or outside of the school day. And that, again, I think that next one, flexibility and adaptability for multiple users speaks to the, the community use of your facilities. Um, and that district, all school districts have limited resources and that whatever is being done, it helps improve operations, instruction, the efficacy of folks within the district. And then finally, <coughs> the need to make sure that you're engaging your community and getting good input from them as well. So the facility study, uh, both through our walkthrough and conversations with the planning committee, we identified a number of items, and we were able to kind of group those items into themes, uh, and we identified 12 themes um, that are listed there. Uh, we'll be going over those individually, but uh, those themes are um, remodeling educational spaces to support programming, whether it's instructional or community programming, um, safety and security, there are some just necessary building upgrades or uh, maintenance work that needs to occur. Uh, there's always a need for additional storage. Uh, your track, which supports your uh, track program, uh, is due for resurfacing. Uh, parking lot improvements. Um, it's, it was, we learned that the school district took over transportation, and so now there's a need to house and uh, maintain the transportation um, department within the school district. Uh, this district has had a long tradition of wanting to continue to be efficient and um, sustainable, so that was another folk, uh, theme that, that kind of rose to the top. Uh, the performing arts was, the performing arts facility was also identified as uh, in, needs of, in need of improvement that we looked at. Modernizing the learning spaces, um, making your playgrounds more accessible, and then there was greater conversation, which was pretty broad in, in scope, around how to improve your uh, campus athletic facilities. So with those themes, I'm going to turn it over to, to Brent and um, Jim and Chris to kind of talk about more in depth about the report. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So uh, starting with the educational remodel, we kind of <laughs> talked about how the interior of the school has the music and um, band uh, choir uh, areas in it. And it kind of does um, have an impact on the education of areas around because of the noise. So there was discussions around whether in addition for those types of um, 
curriculum which is needed or if there was a way to use the existing square footage and we kind of came up with this opportunity to use some of the uh, egg space that um, may not be used in the most efficient manner right now for the band and the choir so we kind of have some some potential um, options of what that might look like and then sort of remodeling that egg tech area with the new curriculum or the sort of consolidation of the curriculums that's kind of coming through here um, with the egg center also kind of helping to consolidate and remodel those spaces for the charter school so that they have a more dedicated space um, not that they're only in that center of the area school but um, that they have the opportunity to kind of be together um, and increase the office spaces for specialized staff so there's um, staff that are kind of you know utilized in the district um, and they need an area where they can um, you know work from and work with students in and through um, so a dedicated space while also maintaining kind of that larger meeting group of the sort of little theater area um, for the needs that that has without taking all of that space over so ma making sure that we have all of those things included was uh, important to um, the planning committee as well as us and it was found and I think it's a pretty exciting thing that a, an addition really isn't necessarily required in order to accomplish all of these um, goals. So, is there anything you guys want to add to that? I don't know. Okay. Um, some other opportunities we looked at were some additional storage, um, certainly at both schools, but here we'll highlight at the high school. Um, the locker area kind of in the bottom right has um, some storage space in it, but it's kind of all secluded and, and difficult to really utilize to the, the square footage to its greatest potential. So looking at uh, kind of adding fence storage to those spaces so that, you know, staff and um, the athletics department and things like that have, have a better location for uh, how they're using the storage able to see into the different lockers and, and, and really utilize that space better for um, the storage that's there. And then getting things off the floor was also kind of a, a desire. So, you know, suspending the mat storage in the auxiliary gym uh, would allow for additional space to be available. Um, and, you know, um, just make it for a, a more user-friendly kind of a thing. And then, the community has a huge presence in the space. That was, like Eric had mentioned, kind of a, an awesome thing to see as we were walking through, uh, but a need for changing areas for the community members as they come in. So kind of having a locker, you know, dedicated locker and a couple of um, changing locations for the community members to utilize, um, whether they're playing pickleball or whatever in the aux auxiliary gym or if they're lifting weights or, or anything else, you know. so. Uh, again, we found a, a, a spot where I think we could kind of tuck that in and not have to do any types of additions, which obviously helps with budget. So, And then at the elementary school, um, it was um, discussed that they just don't have enough storage for the curriculum they have in the physical education department. So um, utilizing some of the space that's in the boys' locker room there uh, to extend that small uh, gym storage closet into more of a usable space with, with uh, some shelving and things like that, I think is something that would be really beneficial for the district and especially the educators in that field. Eric kind of mentioned um, the track resurfacing is, is, you know, it's kind of beyond its useful life and uh, is in need of replacement, so we captured that on the list. Similar idea with the parking lot resurfacing. Um, with a lot of the parking lot has already been done with the additions and previous um, improvements that have been at the, the district here, but um, there's certainly a need for parking lot replacement kind of highlighted there. And then a bus garage was discussed as, as Eric had mentioned, and uh, it was brought up in one of the planning committee meetings, and I think this is a great opportunity and a great you know, reason why we wanted to have those types of discussions because uh, the planning committee 
brought up, brought to our attention that the district is kind of losing um, their existing square footage or spaces where the uh, pitching and batting cages are currently utilized. So by adding sort of an addition to what was kind of the bus garage, and, and we looked at a few different options of locations for the bus garage, um, we're able to kind of bring that, uh, those uses that space back to the district, uh, keep students out of the district, and then have a place for potential restrooms for spectators or students or uh, whatever for events that are happening on campus. Um, and then also having that space for a few buses to be um, um, parked interior, but then also exterior as well, while the maintenance staff has some additional spaces for their um, maintenance equipment and you know other things as well from a storage and, and just being able to work on, on things perspective. And there, there's a current building that is sort of a big problem that's going to be removed. That would be taken down, yeah, with that sort of a, a scope input. Yeah, there was, Where it's not you can really just barely now. see the top, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of pest infest infestation, I guess I'll say. Older storage. That, so sure. Having a better envelope on our newer structure would certainly help me meet that. From a safety and security perspective, um, the, the high school, we, we Kind of notice that you sort of could get buzzed in and then you walk into the office and then from the office you go back into the hallway to get buzzed into the school itself so from a security perspective what you want to kind of do is ensure that you're maintaining flow through the office without allowing people to have an opportunity to get in that aren't necessarily uh, authorized to be in the school so by simply moving or adding uh, an additional set of double doors from, there's kind of a, a set there right at the, the, the wall where that stairwell is. Moving those down a little bit and then adding one additional door forces people coming into the school, into the office, and then also it, you can force students who are leaving to go into the office to make sure they're signing out appropriately and, and that everyone knows where everyone is supposed to be. Um, so a very simple, um, sort of really efficient way to make that uh, office area and, and entrance a lot more secure um, just by moving a few sets of double doors there. Uh, and also, also it was um, discussed that uh, the district just acquired a new sort of daycare facility. So uh, adding communication between this building and that new daycare facility to help with IT issues and security of communication and things like that would be um, necessary as well. In addition to some of the you know more structural changes, um, we were looking at some uh, a visitor identification system. So an example here is you know uh, the Raptor um, system where visitors come in and you, they are required to put in the license that you know their license and then it goes through a background check quickly. And just ensures that office staff are able to see if there are people who really shouldn't be authorized to be in the school based on you know information that would be within that system so kind of incorporating that throughout the district um, and then there are um, many many different sets of keys that are required to get around in the high school um, especially it was it was interesting as we were you know doing our walkthroughs and things we were given keys and the elementary school you get a small key ring with a few keys on it in the high school you get one that you better make sure you've got suspenders on so um, you know rekeying the the high school certainly um, potentially the district uh, and then also you can see there's a, a door knob not really ADA compliant so making sure that we're going to handles and rekeying re interior doors as well. Oh, and sorry, I was also going to mention on that, that um, over the years, it sounds like there have been a lot of keys that have been distributed to coaches and other community members that may or may not be um, understood where those keys are at, you know, time, at the time. So just kind of resetting who the district allows to have access to the building 
after hours is kind of a, an important thing as well. And, and this is not unique to Algoma. I mean, districts across the country experience the same thing, and they try to do a reset similar to what's being proposed here. It's an opportunity to do it. Um, we talked a, about a lot of different opportunities and, and potential with the playground upgrades at the elementary school and it was kind of I identified that a need for an all-inclusive type of a playground surface was necessary um, so you know adding more of that rubberized um, floor for a safer environment for students to play on and a more inclusive environment especially with um, special needs um, students um, to be able to access all the different pieces of equipment and, and also kind of helps with the maintenance thing. You don't have a lot of wood chips or other things getting into the other play areas and getting pushed around and plowed or whatever. So um, kind of fencing around some of that to really separate that drive from the playground areas uh, and then as well as adding those inclusive surfaces. And then we, yeah, we identified a lot of areas where just, you know, building upgrades are, are necessary. So uh, the first one there, there's some plumbing issues from a, a septic perspective at the elementary school that uh, there's odors that are kind of emitted from um, old and, and kind of rotting piping. So replacing all of that, um, doing a restroom remodel for the restrooms here in the high school, uh, bringing those up to, uh, you know, a new standard. Um, and this would also help with the uh, efficiency of uh, utility perspective because you can go with low flow fixtures and ensure that you're only using the water that you need uh, for flushes and things and lavatories and sinks. Um, some roofing needs to be replaced, uh, especially at the elementary school. And then uh, window and door replacements uh, were identified as well where uh, there's a lot of the wood frame type windows, excuse me, that are are uh, rotting and, and just in need of a replacement. From a performing arts perspective, um, audio and visual um, upgrades are you know warranted. I think the intent here is really to minimize from a visual or from a touch and feel perspective the impact because it's such a neat sort of historic um, uh, performing arts center but you know upgrade the lighting and the visuals and things so that the actual uh, activities that are, are done there are are you know have a better environment for the listeners um, and people viewing the space so you know we don't want to really touch the the chairs or anything um, but you know make sure that we're upgrading to probably an LED technology for the lighting that would be for the stage and, and having a better audio experience and then, you know, something that might not be seen all that uh, well is the ceiling is kind of having issues and, and tiles are, are, you know, falling down and things like that. And, and if we're able to go in and kind of just replace the ceiling, kind of reset that, it would really help the maintenance staff. Um, the, the way that you have to replace the tiles is not necessarily an extremely safe uh, activity. So kind of resetting that really would help uh, maintenance staff with issues from that perspective, ensuring that you know we don't have to be up there with scaffolding or trying to do it from above or anything like that. And then uh, a need for you know flexible type of spaces. You know, the, we started out thinking about that from a district whole as a whole perspective, and you know the staff at the high school thought you know maybe they, they don't necessarily need it so um, the elementary school really though they don't have the flexibility with the physical building itself because of the age of that building to do much from a, a remodeling perspective um, without incurring a lot of cost so you know actually utilizing the existing spaces that you have with flexible furniture and uh, storage areas would really be beneficial for the learning environment of um, the students and, and the uh, efficiency that the teachers have in how they're uh, getting through the curriculum. And then we identified some energy efficiency opportunities. So, you know, kind of the elementary school has 
a lot of really great opportunity from a water count or that you guys have done some great things in the elementary school, let me put it that way, uh, from a water efficiency perspective. You've got the um, dual flush where, you know, you, you pull up if you need extra water to go down or you push down if you uh, don't need quite so much water in the bowl itself, uh, adding aerators and things like that. So incorporating those items um, into the restrooms here as well. Uh, would really be helpful and some of this could be in conjunction with the restroom model as I kind of had alluded to earlier um, but also could be independent if that was desired. Um, retro commissioning is something where the, 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 the bones of the HVAC and building automation system are really good and there's a lot of opportunity to use the existing infrastructure that's there to uh, drive out even more uh, energy waste in the building itself. So um, looking at sequences of operation and uh, just how the HVAC equipment is controlled uh, and making some minor adjustments here and there can one, give you guys a lot of you know annual energy savings and two, uh, we can get focus on energy dollars for doing those types of things. And really that's kind of a, that's throughout the energy efficiency uh, list but um, just keep that in the back of your mind. There's opportunity there for focus on energy incentives uh, with the energy efficiency items. Another item was occupancy-based HVAC control. You guys have demand control ventilation in a lot of spots where you're, you're looking at the amount of CO2 that is in the building um, and minimizing it that way, but you can also do temperature setbacks and things during occupied times with occupancy controls and then looking at fume loop controls as well to make sure that we're only ventilating when necessary um, and not all the time. So I think there's one more energy efficiency. Yeah. The district has done a fantastic job of just internally updating the lights, the LED. Um, there are a few areas in the district that still are uh, fluorescent. So just bringing those up to speed, I think, I'm not sure if it's complete yet, but I know that uh, the elementary school classrooms are being done this summer. So uh, the hallways, I think, are left there, and then um, that's kind of the bottom right photo. It's just an example of the hallway, and then the uh, kitchen here uh, is still not LED. So just bringing it all up to the, the same type of uh, technology. And then walk-in cooler and freezer controls are just an opportunity to add additional controls to help the quality of the product uh, in the spaces as well as minimize the amount of energy that is consumed. So uh, it's a pretty neat and effective way to uh, really maximize the operation of the walk-in coolers and freezers. And uh, adding, we noticed that there's a vending machine uh, without the occupancy type controls on it that would qualify for, for that as well. So. And then we talked about athletic field upgrades. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for potential upgrades to the athletics um, and the at least the, the surfaces and, and the playing environment here on the campus at the high school. So, you know, if the track resurfacing were not necessarily done, but you wanted to have a, a larger um, football upgrade, you could expand the football field and get it ready for soccer uh, and then redo the track, put, you know, uh, stadium type seating or, or bleacher type seating there add lights so that the, the um, athletics could be done you know at night and evenings um, and then all of this could be in conjunction with that um, bus garage where the restrooms are there for spectators and things to use um, and then obviously we need a new scoreboard and, and really with kind of Keeping with that theme of you know the community really utilizing the spaces, potentially having kind of a walking path around the the exterior of the of campus where people can you know walk around and really see uh, all the great things that the district has done. So just a lot of different things that we we're looking at uh, from that perspective and, and kind of ideating with the planning committee. Uh, so the football field and soccer field would be housed within the track. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. that's the 
with this type of um, solution. Yep. Right, if, with that option. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a completely different option than just resurfacing the track, is what you're saying. This is an, right. another entire way of looking at it. Exactly. Yeah, because it. Uh, both of those fields would not necessarily fit in your current inside that current track. Well, mm -hmm. and that would be regulation for soccer and the football. The right. um, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, oh, I paused that. Yeah. So we kind of put together some budgets um, associated with each of those categories. So the improvement measure categories from kind of a, a low end to a high end. The flexible spaces we left as kind of to be determined because you could do one classroom, you could do one grade level, you could do the entire school. So still wanted to think about that a little bit more as a, a group. Um, but these are the budgets that uh, we've kind of come up with for the individual items and um, we're looking at the costs as well moving forward. So you have a low here and a high here. Does that, does that high take into account for inflation? So there's a lot of districts now that are past the referendums and now they're finding out that they don't have enough money to do what they want to do. Yeah, we've included like cost increases in there okay. for inflation. Ideally, we'll be within that range. Um, okay. You know, we're not looking at 10% per year again, um, but. You do the best you can. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that's, that is the, that's the report. Um, are, are there any questions related to the report itself? The information within the report? I, I do. I, why would we build a, a, a garage for three buses when we have four? Do we have four buses? Five. So why would we build a garage for three buses? I think the idea for the garage was more as a maintenance facility with the ability to store uh, during the winter months. Some of the buses could be stored inside. Um, this is obviously not a final design, so we can modify it to suit the district's needs uh, because there also was discussion of needing to store the landscaping equipment inside and have maintenance area for that as well. And then on page seven, um, there's two, two charter school areas. Is that, putting that a little bit more to me. That's existing. That's existing. There's. I had to get my magnifying glass out to see this. <laughs> there is a, so like sort of in the proposed area. Okay, I see what you, okay, I, okay, got it. The, well, I, I think your point is, is still accurate, though, because in the, the proposed um, selection or section, you know, bringing in as much as we can from a space perspective to where the current kind of um, band and choir rooms are is desired, right? Mm -hmm. And from trying to match the amount of existing square footage and then also looking at, um, you guys are currently kind of in the midst, I believe, of moving the existing um, admin area or the yeah. district office, office yeah. Yeah, from upstairs to down below. So that space also could be used for charter school. We just kind of put it in there as a line item opportunity. Not that it has to be, but trying to kind of match existing square footages um, while also looking at really consolidating as much as we can those, those spaces. Just a, a question probably for you, Chris. In, in looking at the proposed where the charter school is going to be, which would be right next to the little theater, right? right. Is there any way that there could be like a door put between those rooms to have access? I mean, I don't think little theater is used all the time, is it? I mean, but it just would. I mean, I don't even know if that'd be helpful. There but actually, there actually the already is yeah, already uh, a, a connection oh, between okay. the back of the tonight. stage. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, 
Well, this is gives us a lot to look at and get some additional feedback. So then that leads into what we would recommend based on what other districts typically do following a facility study, and that is engaging your community to get feedback to determine how you might uh, want to move forward with further refining solutions. Um, so what, what we've done is we've kind of laid out uh, a process that might be of interest to the the district on how to move forward with this information, engage your community, um, and then ultimately decide how you might want to move forward. Um, so I, I believe that was shared. This is the scope of and timeline of if you are interested in, in uh, engaging your community. Uh, typically, we would begin by meeting with a district administration, district leadership, to kind of lay out that process. Um, and see you know kind of what timelines you're interested in, in meeting reviewing the scope who you'd like to involve how do you get a nice cross representation of your community to be involved um, as i mentioned earlier the board typically would have a conversation about do you want to engage the community if you do want to engage the community are you going to have a ad hoc committee that you'd like to form and what's the charge of that committee um, providing them maybe some guiding principles to give them some fence posts to work with it. Um, and then typically, if you are gonna pull that committee together, uh, you know, district, it varies from districts and it depends on the scope that they'll be reviewing. Um, I would think that uh, based off of the scope that we presented in this facility study, uh, you could have three meetings that would provide good educational opportunity, garner good feedback from your community, help refine that. Um, information um, and start thinking about are we on the right path for solutions or do we need to do some tweaking uh, another step then to further engage the greater community is to consider a community survey uh, surveys are a great way to not only get a sense of what your community wants and how they would react to the you know proposed solutions but also it's a way to educate the community about what the district's been thinking about and how you came to these conclusions and what does this really mean? And what does it look like? Um, and then typically you bring back that community advisory group again to review the survey results, uh, further reviewed by the administration, and then again to the board to decide what's the logical next step. Um, how might you consider funding this? Is it through fund balance? Is it through IRA federal dollars? Is it through a potential referendum? There's a variety of different ways to address facility solutions, uh, but at that point, that's where the board would try to decide on that. So, um, through this process, I don't want to speak for the board, but I believe that the board is all, would be united in that, yes, we are going to want to involve the community in terms of our decisions. Um, we have to make sure that everybody is on the same page with what we're looking at. Um, so there will be, um, obviously, all the steps you talked about and things will get sort of refined and there'll be a, a lot of education needed. Um, will <coughs> you guys be available to field questions in some of these like meeting situations with the community? Okay. Yeah, yes, actually, obviously. that would be part of what we would offer is to help with the information <coughs> gathering, agenda planning, um, I mean, ultimately, it would be, you know, Mr. Brinkman and, and the team to share this information, but we would certainly help provide um, structure to the process, uh, making sure that, you know, gathering this information so you can present it. Um, if the board decides to move forward with, let's say, a referendum, then typically you move into an informational campaign, and at that point, we would be supporting you know, the creation of materials and um, that collateral kind of things that the, the district could then push out and share. And, and in these educational sessions with the community, you guys could be available for some of them for, okay. Right, and, and for those um, kind of community <coughs> meetings, we would, not only would we help with the, uh, particularly myself and uh, communication specialists would help with 
the agenda planning and process planning, uh, but also would be in attendance to help make sure that it's a productive uh, use of everyone's time. So I have a few going back a little bit, but on the bus garage, what is it included in that? Is that just a shell of a building, or what, what is all included in that price? So it's designed as a, a pre-engineered metal building. Yep. Um, I think Jim can probably speak more to the... <clears throat> yeah, pre-engineered metal building, basic uh, mechanic use, so makeup air unit, LED lighting, garage doors, uh, Again, there's no recessed oil pits or anything of that nature or any equipment that you may, you know, the district would need. But as far as the shell of the building goes for that particular use, it is covered. So your heating, uh, infrared, yeah, infrared heaters. All right. And then on the energy side of it, on the whole packet that you had of the energy efficiency, what percent is going to come back and focus on? What percent of the cost? Of the cost. Oh, uh, a little over 10, probably. Okay. That means you're way high. I think, I mean, we can look into it further if you'd like, yeah. But, and then but is, there, <coughs> is there any grants that you know of that are available? Outside of focus? Outside of focus. Um, there are, yeah, the energy, the Office of Energy Innovation does have grant program. I don't know if it's going to be um, out in 2024, but typically the um, uh, applications are due in January of the year that they're holding it. Um, that is another opportunity, and then obviously the IRA has some potential for um, funding coming in, but the majority probably of the incentives and grants would come through Focus on Energy. The Retro Commissioning Program through FOCUS has a prescriptive um, program based on the square footage of the facilities. So I think that's where the majority of the uh, incentive would come from is through that uh, prescriptive Retro Commissioning Program. Okay. Um, just because if I just do the math, it's, it's, if, we're gonna, if the school district is going to save $33,000 a year, barely pays for the interest that we're spending on that $800,000. Yeah. I, so yeah, I, was, I was wondering how much focus on energy is covering sure. up that cost. Yeah, yep. I think we estimated a little over $70,000, I think that's what it was. Yep. Is that where my question is for now? When you did the um, energy analysis section of um, our utility analysis and baseline section. Um, I didn't see um, the um, solar panels separated mm -hmm. out. Is, is that all included in your? Yeah, so if you actually look, it's interesting. If you look at kind of, you know, big picture, mm -hmm. look at the square footage of the high school mm -hmm. and the square footage of the elementary school, mm -hmm. and then the electric use of the high school and the electric use of the elementary school you would expect that the high school would be consuming a lot more electrical energy than it actually is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you can see the impact from the solar array mm -hmm. is just, you're not, your, your energy use index specific to the electricity is significantly lower than it would have been. Mm -hmm. And you can directly see it there. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would just add the natural gas averages on here for the middle school and high school are not going to be accurate because of the overcharging that we've been um, from WTS. So I would suspect they'd be anywhere from a third to half less than what you are seeing on this graph here. And what was the reason for the fact that we were overcharged? Uh, the meter was um, inaccurate. It was reading the incorrect number of therms that was being put in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that jumped out to us immediately. I mean, I think that probably would have been uncovered if we would have continued to look at that. Um, but yeah, well, no surprising how high that was. Good find. <laughs> uh, that, yeah. Anything else? So, 
maintenance building, I guess that's maybe more for Jesse. Where is, I mean, do we currently have a maintenance building? And what is that going to be reused for if they're putting a new one up? Yeah, so we do have currently a maintenance building. We have one for the vans. Um, and we have one for the equipment, tractors, lawnmowers, um, the trucks with the sanders for plowing and stuff. Um, the space that the maintenance guys have is pretty full, I would say right now. Um, I wouldn't see them using a lot of the space of the bus garage if it was put in though. Um, I think we would dedicate that more just for the transportation needs of the district. And we wouldn't be doing any of the um, oil changes, those types of maintenance projects on the buses. We don't have anyone certified or qualified to be able to do that. Um, it's really just more the um, washing the buses down, you know, some of the paint touch-ups, um, those types of things that would be done in there. subject to change? Can we change some of these things? Uh, possibly. You know, can you do another talk club? Well, I, I, you know, in light of, um, okay, so look, social distancing, six feet. Well, now we find out that that six feet wasn't based on science. That was just a number they, they thought would be. What page are you on? Um, let's see, page four. You know, it does putting details on the floor. I mean, I'm sure, you, I'm sure we had it. it was over every six feet. Well, you know, that's, there's no signs to that. And even same thing with base coverings. I mean, now there's, you know, so many studies came out that said. It says it's it applicable on all of these, though, too. So right. That still does allow us. Right. But there is, there is one here. There is on the page that if your child has COVID and doesn't get tested or they have to wear a face mask. Well, that face mask had little to no effect on COVID. It probably did more harm than good to kids. That is something we would have to have the board then take a vote on because that was our policy that we had put in place. Right. When so. And it was, and it was. Before anybody knew anything. Yeah, but it also was, you know, we have to take a look at what the current CDC guidelines and state guidelines and all that we wouldn't want to take any chance of invalidating our ESSER money um, when we are saying things are optional. I mean, there's going to be different opinions, Pat. Um, I understand that, but so um, you told me the basis for that, and I'll be happy to go along with this. Is there an end date for this ARP Act? Um, so the funding runs out in September of 24. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so this can all be put to rest in September right. of next year. Okay. Okay. And um, we've not had a COVID case since, that I know of since probably March. Mm -hmm. 
There, there's one thing on page seven that um, I just think is sort of awkward the way it's written because it makes it sound like we're beginning something when we are continuing it. It's under student academic needs. Second line, the district plans to continue full-time in-person instruction, which that's what we want to do because that's what we're continuing, beginning the fall of. So I thought, why do we have beginning there? Because we want to continue the full-time in-person instruction the fall of 2023. Right, I think when I when I wrote it that way, uh, or edited what was in there, it was the start of the school year, this coming school year, okay. was my perspective. But, the, but, but yes, we, it, had we have been doing it and we're Correct. continuing to do it. So. Right, right. And so the plan is for this upcoming school year. But you can definitely edit, change that. Yeah. Um, I think if you just take out beginning, it would make it clear that the fall of 2023, we're going to be doing full time as we have, that we're going to continue. Makes sense. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah, this is strictly, this is every six months we have to look at this until our eyes are gone. That right? is correct, yes. That's all I have. All right, any other questions for Jesse? Moving on then, elementary principal report. Katie, my niece. Just a few quick things to share from this past month. Um, during the week of July 10th, we held a pop-up summer school session um, in collaboration with UW Extension. Um, it was a cooking class for students entering grades four through six. So they learned about um, healthy meals. They learned about the, some foundational skills of cooking. They made like two to three different food items each day, ranging from ice cream to waffles to um, grilled cilantro in reusable grow bags. So they really, um, they really touched on a variety of things, and it was a really great time. Mrs. Krieger was the teacher for that, so kudos to her for taking that on this summer as well. Um, but that was we had 16 students, so it's a limited size class. So we had 16 students participate in that. Um, that was a really awesome opportunity. I am happy to report that as far as staffing goes at the elementary, um, besides um, special ed para support, we have filled all of our open positions. So that includes a new high ed teacher, um, a library paraprofessional, and then a 4K kindergarten paraprofessional. Very much looking forward to them joining our team. Um, and then we had some professional development for some of our teachers in the area of math um, in June, at the very, very end of June after our last school board meeting. Um, if you remember me talking about the Bridges math curriculum, that is something that we are looking to expand adoption for, implementation for, for grades three through four. So our third through fourth grade teachers and special ed staff attended a two-day um, implementation training where they basically got to get their hands on the materials, um, learn about the layout of the unit, the lessons, um, we even got to engage in some of the problem solving and discussion as if we were the students. Um, so it was a lot of fun. And then in grades kindergarten through second grade, they also had a half day of training. Um, they've been using the curriculum, but this was just more of a deeper dive into the nuts and bolts. Because with any curriculum, there's just always a lot. Um, and it's good to just take some time to learn more about it. And then next week, the first two days of August, uh, yeah, the first two days of August, um, we have a bunch of teachers coming in for the day, for two full days, to work in the area of literacy. So that would be with our district reading specialist and our reading interventionist. Um, they're gonna lead them through some work, and then the grade level teams will have time to work um, and start planning the units to kick off the beginnings of the school year. So um, it's always nice to have them in. Um, Jill, I get so lonely sometimes at the elementary school. <laughs> Just Marie and I. Jill, you use us. Bridges will basically be kindergarten up to fourth? It, it'll be kindergarten to fourth, and then this year we have to make some decisions on what that will mean for fifth through sixth grade. So, mm 
may run more of a middle school schedule, so we might have to look at some other options for that. And it does include 4K, a little bit of a different format, but they okay. are using the same language and resources as well. Any other questions for Katie? All right, we'll keep moving. Middle school, high school, principal report. Dave? Uh, just give me an update on the Leadership Thrive Venture. We have 28 uh, incoming seniors that are all camping with uh, four staff members, camping and traveling the greater west. Uh, I believe they're tonight they camped out in Yellowstone. Had lots of great uh, um, experiences, including a elk herd stampede. Uh, today there was a grizzly and a black bear at different times. They've seen moose. I'm trying to think of all the things that they've been seeing out there, but um, they're having a great time. Everybody's well, healthy, and um, they're, they're learning some history as well as some natural sciences out in Wyoming today. That's such a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Pathfinder Oklahoma Venture Academy report. Kate. Yeah, so um, Jessica Brogley was an education professor at UW Platteville. Um, reached out to Abigail and I. She hosts a um, podcast ca called the Proud Rural Teacher Podcast um, that she created in the last two years, um, wanting to have us tell our story about ABA. So we are going to be bringing in a couple of students, um, doing some Zooms with her, getting, usually she has like an hour long podcast about um, obviously different opportunities um, in rural areas, not necessarily just in Wisconsin, but in the United States. So. Um, we're really excited to be able to just kind of tell our story the way we wanted to, the who, what, where, why, when um, of ABA and have some students tell their stories and their experiences in ABA um, and just kind of reach to a broader audience about everything we have to offer here. So we're really excited about that. Um, and then for Pathfinder, the facilities crew installed new floors, which we're really excited about because the carpet in there was absolutely disgusting. It was still in there from the bank when it was the bank. So we ripped that out, installed new floors, and um, new cabinetry in the kitchen is being installed. So a little fresh start yeah. for these four years. I realized we really should have slash child care tops. You want to give us a little in we're full. Full still new staff member. Um, I've been getting the kids out to the library events that they've been putting on, which has been really fun. Mm -hmm. um, learning how to walk on a little, I call it the leash, but <laughs> the child care leashes has been a real fun event. But um, yeah, we're getting them out. We're gonna do a beach day in a couple weeks. Um, yeah. So we could still use another child care worker. Yeah, we have a prospective person, but. Special Ed Wellness Report. Marie. Yeah, I'm going to embarrass Shelly first. <laughs> I just have to brag about her because she is amazing and I don't know if she gets enough kudos for how much she does. But she's been helping out with some of the special ed stuff and we started a project together and she essentially just took it and ran with it. She organized all of the special ed files. They were like a huge mess after Wendy retired and we didn't really have anybody in that role, Katie can vouch, like, we just didn't really have a really good organizational system and Shelly took it within like a few days and it's just amazing. So I'm super grateful for her help and she's been kind of getting her feet wet with some of the um, special ed program we use uh, for a program called SEED. So she's going to be doing training this summer so that she can help out with some of the um, behind the scenes work of scanning and entering things and getting some forms and mailing. It'll be a huge help, so I'm super grateful for her and I just want everybody to know how amazing she is. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing that I had. <laughs> Sorry, Shelly. The second thing, I before the meeting, I placed this little kind of rough draft packet by you. Um, Katie and I, and with 
And with Dave as well, just really as a leadership team, we've been trying to have some intentional conversations around um, the multi-level systems of support. So these are a lot of things that we already have in place, but just we saw a need for creating more of a framework for um, teachers as a resource when we're having um, new curriculum, like with the bridges or with some of the literacy work that we're doing at the elementary school. Um, this is a framework for the teachers in the event that there is a student that may not be responding to the lesson or is excelling in the lesson. Um, just kind of a step-by-step -step guide as to how we are going to collaborate as PLC teams and use the data to be proactive. Um, being um, overseeing special ed, it might sound kind of backwards of me saying this, but like my mindset is always how can we be proactive and prevent the need for special education. Special education is intended to be the most intensive support where sometimes there's a mindset that in order to get support, a student needs to be in special education. And really, that's kind of a backwards mindset. Um, since the law changed in 2013 for response to intervention, we as school districts want to provide any supports that we can to be proactive, to pro provide intervention to, I'm being redundant, but to prevent the need for a special education referral. Obviously there are exceptions to that, but this is just a nice little framework to explain the work that we are doing. Mm -hmm. um, with that, we've created a pupil services form for staff um, to submit to a pupil services team for us to review and provide strategies or suggestions, um, but really just kind of a rough draft, as it says, for a process that we are hoping to get started with in the fall. Any questions on that? I didn't really give you time to review it, I'm sorry. But. <laughs> no, I think this looks good. Mm -hmm. That is all I have for this meeting. Any questions for me? convention um, I know it seems very early but Tammy said that it you know she really needs to know by the middle of August a pretty darn good idea of what how many rooms and where we want to stay um, because otherwise we won't get them what we thought last year was because there's the opportunity to cancel if you don't need it you don't get a full refund is what we found out last so um, we got, we still had to pay for one night out of the three. So that's, you know, real money. So if you can all think about it, I mean, the days are here. Um, I know it's a whole different story when you um, are working, have a family, and have to take vacation days for it. Um, I remember those days. doesn't make it as easy as once that isn't the case. So um, take a look, see if it's feasible, and then um, maybe I'll try and do a little poll of everybody. Um, second week of August or something so we can give her the information. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's usually we go down on a Tuesday, um, and there are some Tuesday afternoon sessions that when I was a new school board member, I took advantage of. Um, so certainly that just depends on how early in the day we would get down there. Um, Wednesday's a full day, Thursday's a full day, Friday's a half day. Um, really good information. Um, but again, sometimes board members have chosen to do part of it, haven't been able to, you know, or you know, either able or wanting to use their vacation time for the whole thing. Um, but, so, think about it, look at the calendars, decide if you can come to any or all of it, um, and then we'll try and get the information to Tim. Um, she had asked, um, I would said we stayed at the Deviltree, that's where, you know, we've been staying, but you, I guess, 
you had men mentioned, what about just the Hilton? What's the difference in price? Okay, so yeah. we should have her check. Check that out, what's the difference in price? She's going to so. check that out. Okay, and, and it doesn't, you know, you don't, and, you know, I get your family's kids, jobs. Yeah. Um, you don't have to go down the whole time. Some people just come okay. in for a day. Right, that's what I was saying. Yeah, people can come for a day. Um, we can usually get, um, I mean, there's the main sessions are Wednesday and Thursday. So if you're going to come for a day, you want to come for one of those yeah. because those are full days of sessions. Um, but yeah, exactly. And you'll get a book of, of all the sessions that are there. If you find something that you really want to go to, a couple of them, you might just want to go down for the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Milwaukee isn't that far. It's, you know, certainly something you don't even have to stay overnight if you yeah. don't want to. So. so anyway, think about it. And we will try and get her that information. All right, moving to action items. I need a motion to approve the regular board meeting minutes of June 26, 2023. Okay, so second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. I need a motion um, to accept the bills that were presented to you. So moved. So okay. second. Motion made by Pat, seconded by Ann. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I need a motion to approve the co curricular code handbook as presented. Move. Motion made by Chris. I'll second. Second by Chris B. Questions or discussion on that? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I need a motion to approve the coach's advisor's handbook as presented. So moved. Motion made by Pat. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Anne. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I need a motion to approve the milk bid. You had it at your um, spot when you came. That looks like we only got one. Oh no, I guess Dean and Anne. I'll make a motion. Yes, okay. and Pam. Okay. Um, so we put three bids out for um, milk prices, and we only received one back. The Prairie Farm is the one we have gone with last year, and they submitted a bid for this year. Um, the Dean Foods was one we had in 21 22. See the difference in price from um, comparing on two years with the Prairie Farm. Actually, went down about a penny per carton. So, um, given there was only one bid that um, that was returned, um, the motion and the second would assume to be the Prairie Farms. Okay. Um, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we are going to table the bread bid as we have not gotten anything back. Correct. I need. Um, I'll make a motion to table the okay. bread bid till we get. Right. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I need a motion to approve the Wisconsin model academic standards for the 23 24 school year. So moved. Second. Motion made by Pat, seconded by Chris B. Questions or discussion on that? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I only had a few eyes. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Opposed? <coughs> carries. I need a motion to approve the COVID-19 safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan for the 23-24 school year. So move. Motion made by hand. Do I hear a second? We need to approve Since we needed to get our funds, I guess I'll second it. Motion by Ann, seconded by Pat. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I guess with that, can we put it on our committees to look deeper into that? Um, 
in further before, before six the months? Review, absolutely. As I, Pat brought up earlier. Sure. Yeah, and there might be even more new stuff out there. So. All right. Um, motion and second. Any further comments or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. A uh, request for future agenda items. Anybody? All right. Then I need a motion to go into executive session under Wisconsin statute 19.85. Subsections 1 C, E, F, and I for personal matters, hire staff and resignations. I'll move. Second. Chris S. Second by Chris B. Roll call vote. Chris B. Yes. Pat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Chris S. Yes. And 